Ephesians chapter number 4. Begin reading verse number 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby we lie and wait to whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, but whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work the uncleanness, all uncleanness, with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now, we read a lot. We're going to get through a lot. So if I start talking way too fast for some of y'all, just stop me after Sunday school and I'll answer any questions you got there, things that you missed. First thing I want to point out, <clears throat> I like things that are peculiar or rare in the Bible. Uh, we read one account in verse number 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith. That word unity, you're going to find it three times in your Bible. Two of them are in this chapter. Look at verse number uh, four. There's one body, one spirit, even as you're called, uh, a hope of your calling, and Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Okay, he's talking about this entire chapter, unity. Okay, then he's, you know, we can go over to, what is it, Psalm 130, it's either 133 or 113. How sweet it is that the brethren dwell in unity. That's another instance you're going to find, but two of them are in this chapter. This whole chapter is about unity. Unity of the church, unity of the believer in Christ, unity between our spirit and his spirit, unity of the new creature and our will. Okay, now when we say will, we know that it's more than just what we want to do right here, right now. Right? Your will is an all-encompassing word that says this is how you have determined to live your life. Certainly that impacts right here in the decision that you make right now. But just because somebody makes a decision here and now does not mean that it's going to change the way that they live their life. How many times have we seen services where somebody will come down to the altar, big alligator tears, and then before you know it, one, two, three services later, they're living just the same way that they were before. Right? How many times does it take us to come to the altar, and we may be sorry for what we've done, but we haven't truly repented of what we've done? Right? That's just one example. Our will was stronger than our will to follow after what God would have us to do. We wanted to stay where we were rather than get closer to God. But it's not one action that is the will of man. It is the pattern of works that would define your life. That your will is almost synonymous with your testimony. Right? People know what you believe, how much you believe it, and how much you're willing to stake your life upon what you believe by the way you live. That is your will. Okay, if somebody were to have a reputation of, you know, but they're hit and miss at church, right? Their will is that, you know, it could be easily determined that their will is they don't want to be here every time the doors are open, right? They do forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Well, they're one of them. 
that it's their manner. That they just come when they feel like they should be here. Or they come when they need an excuse. Or maybe they think that they need to provide God a reason to bless them. Not just an example. But how many other... I mean, I don't know who does and who don't. But if you don't tithe, your will's not lined up with God. Right? If you aren't actively participating in the propagation of the gospel, witnessing, handing out materials, then your will's not in line with God. It was the first commission that he gave to the church. Right? The underlying, overriding agenda was that to go. And then when we go, to tell. You can go and not tell anybody. But go and then tell. If we don't do that, our spirit's not lined up with it. We are not unified in the will that we have in the will that God has for our life. Okay, so this whole chapter being about unity, let's get back to verse number 11. Right, it's God's will that to some he gave apostles. Well, who's that? Not us, because all the apostles are gone. Okay, but to some he gave apostles that had powers before the completed word of God to prove that they were who they said they were, men that were of God. Right, but then the apostle, when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away with. This right here is all the proof that we need that Jesus is who he said he was. Okay, but for the unity of the early church, some he gave apostles, right? Some he gave prophets in the Old Testament, right? Some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? So that your understanding could be unified with the way that God wants you to understand it, right? Rightly dividing the word of truth in 2 Timothy, right? That we be taught the whole counsel of God. Why? Because God wants you to have a unified understanding of the Bible. He doesn't want you to know in part and then not know in part. He said that the Spirit would lead and guide us into all truth. And we've already read that in Christ is all truth. So what's that mean? The Spirit's guiding you to be more unified with Christ so that you understand all truth. Okay, then verse number 12. For the perfecting of the saints, or the completing of the saints. That doesn't mean sinlessness. Right? We can go back to Job. The Bible called Job the perfect man, but Job still had sin. He still went out and made sacrifices every day for his own sin. Right? That perfect means complete in your faith. For the perfection of the saints. Why? For the work of the ministry. That we be complete so that we perform the ministry the way that God intended us to do it. That nothing be lacking. That we don't do it for vainglory. That we don't do it for ulterior motives. That it's not about gainsaying. It's not about being hirelings. It's not about lording salvation over other people. No, we're supposed to take it, as we're getting ready to read, in love. And it is through love that we are perfected in Christ. We are unified with Christ. Okay, verse number 13. Till we all come into the unity of the faith. Well, what's that mean? Well, one of these days, okay, we're going to put off mortality... He's going to put on us immortality. We're going to have a body fashion like His. Every saint that has ever been is going to be forever unified with Christ in glory. There will never be separation between us and God. That unity is the perfect unity. That's the overall will of God. That's why He would that none would perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's why He would that everyone that did believe, it was predestinated that they would be conformed to the image of His Son. Because if we weren't conformed to the image of His Son, we couldn't be unified for all of eternity. We'd be stuck down here, and He'd be in glory. Because He's perfect, and we aren't. But it's this flesh, it's the curse of sin that keeps us separated from Him. The only thing keeping us from heaven is this flesh. Right? Our conversation's already recorded there. Right? Our name's recorded there. He said he's gone to prepare a place for us. What's that mean? You've already got a home over here. Got all that put together. Only thing that keeps us from being perpetually and perfectly unified in Christ for all of eternity is that I'm just waiting for him to call me up. But in the meantime, 
right? Knowing that that's the goal. Look back at verse number uh, 14. That we had, or verse number 13. Till we all come to the unity of one faith. Till. What's that mean? We should continually be perfected from verse number 12 until we get to him and we're forever perfectly unified with him. It should be our, you know, overall desire that today I would be conformed more into the image of Christ than I was when I woke up. That's not always easy. It's not always an enjoyable experience to be put on the potter's wheel and to be compressed or to be stretched or to be shaped because the flesh resists it. Our pride resists it. Right? Even in our spirit, we can grow weary in well-doing. We know that it happens. But in those moments, you don't feel like letting God push and pull on you to bring out more of Himself and to get rid of some of you. Right? Not always an enjoy, but it should be our desire that, Lord, it may not be comfortable, it may not be convenient, it may not even make sense to me, but whatever you have to do to make me into a vessel of honor for your honor and your glory, I'm on board with it. Because see, a potter will take a piece of clay and he'll work it into whatever he wants to. Clay doesn't have any say. But God, being a gentleman, won't force us to become what we don't want to become. He could. He's God. He's omnipotent. He's got all power. He could, you know, be as a cruel master and force us to do. But he didn't call us servants. He called us friends. He wants us to dwell in unity with Him like He desires to dwell in unity with us. And until we have that desire, we will not allow God to continually... We will not get into the Word of God and allow the water of the Word to wash over us, knock off those rough edges. We will not abide inside of the hedge. Instead, we'll break the hedge and He who breaks the hedge, serpent biteth. Until our will is unified with His. There's nothing we can do. Right? If my spirit's not in fellowship, not in unity with the Spirit, right? Any teaching I do, sounding brass, thinking, tinkling cymbals. Any singing I do, it doesn't reach the halls of heaven. Right? I dare say it doesn't even reach some of the ears of people sitting in the audience. Right? The prayers that I have, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God doesn't hear my prayers. If I know that I'm not where God wants me to be, there's nothing I can do for the ministry. There's a lot I can do for myself. Very little I can do for the cause of Christ. Right? Why do you think he started off with us being in unity with the one who wants to be unified with us? He hadn't even gotten to the church yet. He's just talking about us and God. Then look with me in verse number 13 again. He says, Till we come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. What's that? When we see Him as He is. Okay. Unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What's that mean? On that day, right now I'm robed in His righteousness. The Father doesn't see me, He sees the Son. Well, on that day, the Father will see me as I am because I, in the fullness of my salvation, am just like the Son of God. Oh, happy day. Right? Verse number 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. What's he say? Your perfecting, your maturity, the work of the Holy Spirit to draw out that new man and for us to lay down the old man and crucify him daily. Right? That process is so that we be no more children spiritually. Right? Children, unless you tell them to look both ways before they cross the street, they want to get from one side of the street to the other. They're just going to walk out in the street. Right? They don't know better. Right? And then even when they don't want to, you know, because they grow up and then they start thinking, well, I can walk across the street without holding somebody's hand. Right? Generally, where do children look? Right at their feet. They're not looking up at what's going on around them. They're just worried about where they're going. 
How many Christians can that describe? They have no foresight into, well, Lord, I understand that you're doing something. I may not see what it is, but I do know where you're taking me. Where's that? Home. Glory. I also know that you promise that every step along the way, you be there with me. So whatever I'm going through, so long as my spirit's unified with the Spirit of God, it may not be enjoyable, but it's what God wants to happen so that what God desires as a result in our life will come true. Right? I've said it before. Right? The only thing that can scratch a diamond is a diamond. The only thing that can cut a diamond is a diamond. Right? They take diamond dust and they put them on them big old excavator teeth. You know why? Because it's going to cut through whatever rock you try and dig that excavator through. You know how somebody figured out that there's only one way you can cut or scratch a diamond? They tried scratching it with everything else. Right? By claiming, you know, openly proclaiming the name of Christ and that He did for me what nobody else could do, we claim that we've got something precious inside of us. And we claim that nothing on earth can touch it. But see, we know that's true. God knows that's true. The world doesn't know that's true. So sometimes God has to allow things that the world does understand. Hardness, pain, suffering. Those things that would make an impact on other people. And they have to see that come across our life. And it didn't even scratch them. What's that say? What I've got is different than anything that you know about. It's through hardness and it's through testing that other people really can't see what we've got the real deal. And then goes on to say that we'd be no, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Right? Who do the deceivers always target? The vulnerable. Those that wait in shadows. Those that lie in wait, they're not waiting for Superman to go walking by. Right? They're waiting for the one that's limping around, that they've got all their, they're complaining. They want to sit down and take a rest and let the rest of the pack move forward. It's the sheep that leads the fold that the wolf gets. He's saying, don't be a sheep. Well, be a sheep, but be a sheep that stays with the pack. Right? Don't be a dumb sheep. And then all sheep are dumb. What's he saying? Stay close to the shepherd. He's saying those that are carried about with every wind of doctrine, they're tossed to and fro. What do they do? Anything piques their interest, they're walking away from it. Well, what's this over here? The sheep that wonders what something smells like may never come back to the fold to tell everybody what it smelled like. That the one that got bored just walking around following the shepherd and went off in a different direction may be the last decision that they ever make. If they do come back, right, we've heard our pastor use the illustration, first time a sheep walks away from the fold, if it shepherd will scold it, bring it back to the fold. But if it becomes a problem, he'll break the leg of the sheep and carry it around on its shoulders. And they say afterwards that that sheep will never leave the side of the shepherd ever again. You say, well, that's a cruel thing to do. Well, it was for the sheep's own good. Sheep would have got hurt if it didn't stay next to the shepherd. Right? But that only happens if the shepherd can find the sheep. Okay? Now, a shepherd, if he goes and he looks long enough, he may not find the sheep. We've got an om omnipotent, all knowing all-powerful God. He knows right where we are. But again, we're not just sheep. We're sheep with free will. If we're carried about with every wind of doctrine like the prodigal, we have to come to ourselves and come back to the Father's house to repent and get it made right before the Father can take us back into the fold. He may send chastisement because we're without chastisement. We're a bastard, not a son. He may send correction, but until we realize we've got to be back at the fold, he's not coming to get us. We know where we ought to be. 
Right? There's something deep, just like Jeremiah said, there's a fire shut up in our bones that we know where we ought to be, just our pride that keeps us from going back. If we're carried away with every wind of doctrine, there's a chance that our pride will keep us from ever coming back to the truth. There's a chance that the snares of the world and the snares of the devil, right, we become so accustomed to them that we just think that that's a part of normal life. You say, that doesn't happen. happens all the time. People get out of church. They know that they should be back in church, but they're too ashamed of what they did or what they became after they left that they don't want to darken the doors of the church anymore. They feel like they don't deserve it. Well, they're right. None of us deserve Christ. I mean, it would have been a whole different story if somebody said, hey, I know about somebody that you don't deserve and that I don't deserve, but I think he might want to help us out. No, God himself came and said, I don't care you know, what it is that caused you to be in sin. I'm going to make the payment so that I can buy you out of sin. Right, that's one of the cruel tricks of the devil. Now, if your will's lined up with the will of God, you understand you don't deserve anything. You get out of the will of God, the devil will start telling you that you don't deserve it, and instead of remembering that I never deserved it in the first place, you'll just understand how much you don't deserve it right now, and you'll convince yourself that if you came back, God wouldn't want you anyway. That's not what the Bible says. But people that get out of church get out of the Bible. In fact, long before they leave the church, I guarantee you, they've left the Bible. We spent too much time on that. We could go. Okay, verse number 15. He says, not being carried about with everyone to doctrine, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. He said, as children, okay, what's, the Bible talks about the great mystery from the beginning. What was that great mystery? That God would choose to put His holiness, Himself, right, His Son in unworthy earthen vessels. In fact, the Bible says that He would hide it in earthen vessels. Why would He do such a thing? Because if as children we begin to mature and we grow, we grow into Christ. What comes up out of the earthen vessel isn't anything that you can find on earth. Right? What's put on display isn't the pot. It's what comes out of the pot. And what comes out? Well, if we grow, right, in truth, in the nurture and admonition of not only God, but also the brethren, right, if we disciple others, if we instruct others, if we bear one another's burdens, if we live as examples for others to show them that, hey, what the Bible says is true. Right? God does use other people sometimes as examples of faith to encourage other people and grow their faith. Right? If we do that, we grow up not into us. Oh. If God wanted me, Christ would have had to come. If God was satisfied with the fruit that I could produce, right, I wouldn't have had to have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, and that all my fruit is bad. He says, no, if you just let God do the work in you, you grow, but you don't grow into the new version of you. You grow into the version of you in Christ. But it doesn't say may grow up around him in all things. Right? He's not the root that's hidden. Okay? Although he is our root. You know, he's our foundation. He's the rock that can't be moved. Right? The stone that was cast aside by the chief of the builder, but yet God chose to make him chief of the corner. Right? He is our solid rock. He is our root. But he's not a hidden thing. You, you do realize that all the important things about a tree are hidden underneath of the bark? About everything that makes the tree work, you can't see it. Right? It's not one of those things where 
He's doing all the work behind the scenes and then everybody sees Jordan the bark on the outside. No, that's not the way that God intended it. God intended it that His Son be preeminent and receive all honor, all glory, all praise. I shouldn't want the world to see me. I should be begging God to knock, knock the bark off of me so that they can see Christ. No, no, no. He's not just the root. He's everything. The little bit of me that He grafted into the vine isn't what you see. You see the tree, the vine. You're not looking at a branch. You're looking at Him. When we mature in Christ, you don't see me anymore. Christ comes up. Right? Not my fruit that starts popping out. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Right? And the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of Christ, are one and the same. They're both God. Right? Why do you think that the nurturing and the growth of a Christian is brought about by truth and love? Because He is truth and love. That right? He's way truth and life, and God is love. Through those two things, the mature, the elders of the church, the experienced in the church, with love and truth, can give a new believer, an old believer, or somebody in between, everything that they need in order for Christ to not only save them, but also for Christ to raise them up into what He wants them to be, which is what? The vessel. Doesn't want us to be the tree. He wants us to be the vessel of honor. What comes up out of the vessel, not a part of the vessel. You can look at this vessel and say, hey, there's nothing special there. Who would want that? That's just made out of dirt. Some dirt was mixed with water. They threw it into a kiln and then something came out. Not too impressed with it. What people take note of is what comes up out of the vessel. We can grow, and He's making me into what He wants me to be, but He's wrapped all around me. You can't see the old man anymore. All you see is the new man. And keep in mind, you know, we've already read, the unity that we truly desire for is that one day we'll see Him as He is. And because we'll be able to see Him, we'll have to have a body like His, because if man see him, can't live. That's what he told Moses. So in order to behold him as he wants me to behold him, I have to be like him. That's the finished work. But in the meantime, he can start showing out a whole lot more than we'd let him. He can start showing out in ways that the world would have to stand back and say, that's not usual. That's not something that we understand. How does that happen? through unity between me and God. Lord, I'm okay with getting zero attention because your son deserves all the credit, all the praise, and all the glory. Lord, I don't want pats on the back. I want people to stand back and take note of what you did and understand that it was a work of God, not a work of man. In fact, we want the tree to get all the credit so that people aren't looking at the pot. Imagine if you went to an orchard, all the fruit in the world, and the, you know, the orchardman, whatever the owner of an orchard's called. I don't think it's a farmer, but anyway. He says, you can take whatever you want, all the fruit you want. What good would it do if you just walked around looking at the ground where the roots were coming out? What's going on down here? You'd miss the fruit, you'd miss the tree. If all the focus is on me, they're not going to see what God has coming out of me, the new creature. They're still focused on that thing that's, you know, dry and cracked, and God's still working on it. But in the meantime, He's still doing the work with something imperfect. What's that? He's just showing Himself out. He's displaying His Son, who's altogether lovely, who has no fault in Him, so that others will see that Jesus really is the answer. But if all the attention's on the pot, they're going to miss the tree. They're going to miss the fruit. We ought to desire to grow up into Him. Not to grow up alongside. Not to grow up in front of or behind or 
to surround it and well this is what he's made me into and then this is what I look like on the outside no the inward man shows out a whole lot more than we think in our heads it's what's inside that works its way out through how you talk through how you walk how you live what's going on in here they see it but you think anyone can or not but when we're unified we grow up into something beyond ourselves that others have to take note of because we couldn't do it for ourselves what's that we grow up into him not because of him not doing our best to look like him no just let him do the growing and allow him to work me into what he wants me to become which is like him right, verse number 16 from who the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part make its increase of the body unto edifying of itself in love there's a whole lot here but what he's saying is Christ being the head right we got that in verse number 15 okay it says from whom the whole body fitly joined together in other words what he's saying is God started building the church from the top down started with the head who's also the foundation he's the head of the church but he's also the foundation of the church and everything in between it fits off of him it's fitly joined together from the top okay you know when buildings usually start tumbling over when they get too big for their foundation well how can a church topple if you started building from the top and the one at the bottom is the same one at the top Christ can never get too big for Christ right? it's all built off of him but it's built top down what's that mean it means that he joined us to him he came down to become like us so that we could become like him right? he put on mortality so that we could put on immortality well when he ascended back up to heaven he said once you get saved we're not building from mortality to immortality he says you've been bought with a price you're mine we're starting up here why do you think he said that we're already seated in heavenly places he sees us where we will be not where we are right? he sees what we will become that's why he robed us in his righteousness so that the Father could look on us in joy and in love now until we get there. He started building from glory back down this way. He made the way, but when the church started, he said he fitly joined it together from the head. That's all they're saying. Either way you go, you're joined to Christ from the foundation, from the head. But talking about a body, if you don't have a head... Right? if I had a head but there was nothing that connected what's inside of my head to the rest of my body it wouldn't work right? you got this thing called a spinal cord right? and then before that they're called a brain stem and then it goes into your brain right? ask Brother Clint about it he's a radiologist he shoots x-rays into people and sees that stuff all the time right? what does that do the head if it wasn't fitly joined to the rest of the body wouldn't communicate to the body couldn't control the body and then most importantly couldn't direct the body we're fitly joined to him it started with him and he fitly joined us to him at the head and then everybody else that come along since he's fitly joined along the way to make the you know globally talking about the whole church everybody that's ever been saved it's all fit together in him it starts with the head locally at individual called out assemblies he's the head and the church he's connected from the head down what's he say he's already taken care of all the ligaments all the nerves all the bone support he knew what we were he knew what he was and he said I'm going to join them to me so that together in their imperfectness they can come together look at the end right edifying of itself in love that through my love imperfect individuals with a perfect savior inside of them can show the perfect love of God and edify or strengthen build up the rest of the church why because we're joined to him 
If he wasn't ahead and if we weren't fitly joined to him, I couldn't show you the love of Christ. Because I wouldn't have the love of Christ in me. Because I wasn't fitly joined to him. What he's saying is, he joined you into the church, but he also fitly joined you to him, to the head. Right, thankfully, God understands things that I don't, because I don't understand how you can have a whole bunch of different things attached to the head and it look like a body. Right, but it's the analogy that he chose to use. He says, nobody is below anybody. Nobody starts at the foundation. I didn't connect you to the foundation. I connected you to the head. He said, I wanted you to have all the richness, the closeness, and the proximity to me that everybody else has ever had. Nobody's a second class citizen in God's eyes. He fitly joined you directly to himself. But then collectively as the church, he fitly framed us together that through love, true love, we could edify one another to what? Have unity between our spirit and his spirit. We understand that as people, we got bad days. We understand as people that there are days we want to quit. We don't want to roll out of bed. That we just want to, you know, take the cell phone, throw it at the wall until we realize that we'd have to buy a new cell phone and it cost a whole lot more than the old cell phone did because the price of them skyrocketed. But I'm thinking about going back to an old flip phone. I'm not kidding. I used to be able to text in my pocket without looking at the screen. Yeah, that was talent. I had to look at the screen to read the text that I just got, but I could, I could text back now looking at it. That's how you don't get caught in school. But what's the point? We're supposed to be unified together. But we're to encourage others. Hey, I've had that day. I may not know exactly what you're going through, but I felt the same way, even though it may not have been for the same reason. And you know what I can tell you? He was enough. We are to encourage others not to aspire to what I am. No, the love of the church is to edify one another to stay in unity between your spirit and his spirit. Because being in fellowship with my spirit may not be good for you, depending on which day it is. Right? I may be the exact opposite of what you need that day. You know who's always who you need to be? Or is, who always is what you need? Him. But I may be able to do a very small thing for you just to remind you that, hey, I've been there. Or, hey, I've seen that in other people, and you know what helped them? Christ. I can pray with you. I can give you a verse. Most of the time, you already know the verse. Right? You don't want to be preached at. You just want to vent. You just need to roll your burden off of your shoulders for a second. You don't want to throw it down and cast it by. It's too important to you for that. But just for a minute, you want to roll it over onto somebody else and just say, I just need to vent, take a break. And then at the end of it, you realize, all right, I'm dumb. I was stupid. I understand I was wrong. I just need to vent. Give me my burden back. I'll keep on going. I'll take up my cross and I'll follow after him. But it may be through love that you just hold somebody's cross so it doesn't fall over. It may be in love that they just need a break because they've been kicked, they've tripped, they've done what it, they just need a minute for God to apply a balm of Gilead. They just need that sweet presence of the Holy Ghost to remind them that He's never left them nor forsaken them. Right? We don't cause the growth. Right? Love and truth cause us to grow up into Christ. But edifying is not growing. What is it? It's stabilizing. If you edify a building, right, you make it structurally sound. You could stack everything on top of one another. You, you built it, but unless you edify it with mortar, right, unless you've got struts and beams in the right spots, the wind blows, structure's going to come down. The edification process is what keeps what's gone up from coming back down. How do we edify? Through Him, truth, and love. Where do we find truth? Where do we find love? From His Spirit. It's all from Him. But what's He do? Sometimes He just uses people to help other people. Sometimes He takes the Word 
and he takes a word fitly spoken from one of his and he just puts a little bit of mortar on somebody's life and if they take it to heart it makes them stronger they can look at examples of other people take heart from it that if they can do it I can do it not because they're anything less than me but because God promised that he'd do for me what he did for everybody else he's no respecter of persons so if they could overcome I can overcome not because of me but because of the one in me it's edification that keeps those that may be about to topple over from toppling over we make up the hedge we stand in the gap so that those that need help can receive it from God why do you think that the called out church right, the structure of the church is so important because there's a place that people know that is dedicated to reserved for the use of God and given solely to the glory and praise of God that they can come and hear what God says that they can come and be around God's people that there's a place where the body of local believers can come together and we know that we can find truth and love among God's people to help steady us as we continue to live as we believe God would have us to live verse number 17 this I say therefore and testify in the world that you henceforth not walk as other Gentiles right, we're going to summarize real quick how do Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind it's all about them and them we know that the word vanity means emptiness right, they walk after the emptiness of self all they're trying to do is fill a bottom of this pit in their soul that can't be satisfied until they come to the knowledge of Christ it's vanity it's emptiness there's never any substance or sustenance to it right, but then he goes on to say verse number 18 that their understanding has been darkened because they've been alienated from the life of God okay, through ignorance what's that? lack of knowledge lack of truth they don't understand God because they don't understand God they live in darkness because unless you know God you cannot be with God. Right? So you're alienated in ignorance. Before you knew about God, before God came or sent somebody by your direction right, to tell you about God, you had never entertained the idea of God. It wasn't until by the word they heard, right? how'd they hear? Preaching of the word that they understood that they had a lack of knowledge, that they were ignorant about something. Right? It was our ignorance of God, because of sin, that we were alienated from God. Right, And then what's the beginning of verse number 18 says? That their understanding was darkened. When you're away from God, you're not thinking straight. You're not seeing things in the right light. Right? Because you don't see things as He sees them, you see them as you see them. Knowing not that you are cold, wretched, blind, groping in the darkness. Right? Then goes on to say because of the blindness of their heart that's why the darkness and the alienation the ignorance the lack of understanding all happens because they blinded their heart to the truth of God the Bible says that man's without excuse without excuse to know that there is a creator because we can look around at everything that was created and know nothing that I see made anything else it took a divine hand to do this man's very soul because man was given a soul in the garden to dwell with God man's very soul knows that there is a God because our soul was God breathed right God breathed into Adam the breath of life and man became a living soul our very soul was a gift of God so our soul knows that God's real but we blind our hearts to the fact that God knows best and then where do we get? We get back out into the darkness. We fall back into ignorance. We have no understanding. Why? Because we've cut off truth from our life. Right? Then, it goes on to say, who being past feeling. What's that mean? doesn't mean that they don't feel pain, they don't feel hurt, they don't feel... Ask the world. There's a lot of people that are hurt that are in pain they have a lot of things that they're dealing with about feeling physical, emotional, mental 
You feel a lot. But what it says is that they're past feeling, they're past compassion. They're past love because they've blinded themselves to the one that is love. So they forget about compassion. All they're consumed with is self. Right then, goes on to say that because they have no compassion, because they regard not the love of God in their life, they give themselves over to all lascivious, what's that? All wickedness. In fact, lascivious is a wickedness, the, you know, the most wicked of the wicked. Then it goes on to say, verse number 20, but ye have not so learned in Christ. He didn't say, hey, this is why Gentiles need to get saved, because this, this is what they're going through. He says, verse number 17, that henceforth ye walk not as other Gentiles. He doesn't say once you get saved, you can't go back to it. He says, no, once you're saved, avoid it. Don't walk this way. Embrace truth. Embrace love. Embrace growing up into Christ. He says, because the minute that you leave the truth, you start blinding yourself. The minute you leave the truth, you forget about the one that cared about you more than he cared about anybody else. Although he cared about everybody else the exact same. Right? God loved you on purpose directly. And yet if we blind ourselves, we can convince ourselves that nobody cares. Well, nobody ever cared like Jesus, but that doesn't mean that nobody ever cared. Right? If we revert back to the vanity of self, trying to heap unto ourselves things that satisfy the flesh, what do we do? We blind ourselves to the truth of God. We'll forget or, you know, the will of God for our life. It's always perpetual. I can't stay where I am today, or I can't be today where I was yesterday and expect to be in the will of God. There's always movement, progression. So we may have known what the will of God for our life was, but that may not be the case anymore. So without knowing the will of God, how can we expect to have unity with God we blind ourselves because we don't know what the will of God is for our life we don't know what God would want us to know for that day All right, early will I seek thee why because I need them today I need the truth that I need for today so that I can walk as best I can I'm going to fail them because I'm still you know, in flesh but do my best to walk after Christ and when I fail him instead of being blinded to my failure, blinded to my sin, blinded to my iniquity, because I love him so much, I want to repent of it right here and right now. I don't need to wait till Wednesday or Sunday. I can get it made right now and keep on going. Where's that come from? Compassion, feeling, knowing that what I just did hurt the Son of God. But the reason that he didn't just die to save us from past sins is because after we got saved, he, we still sin. The sins I commit after I got saved still caused him just as much pain on the cross as the sins that he forgave me of before I got saved. Well, he said, if you lose compassion and the love of God, I mean, look what the Bible says in the last days that there'd be a lack of natural affection. That sinful man is past feeling. Well, what happens when God's people get past feeling? Just don't live that way. How do we live? Verse number 21. That we've heard and been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Who renews us? The spirit renews our mind. How do we get that renewing? Unity. Through fellowship with him, my inward man is strengthened, and that strengthening allows me to rule over this flesh as a king. Right? Revelation 1. He's made his kings and preached kings to rule and reign over this body. Where do I find that strength? Through unity with the Spirit. When my mind, because it's made of the same stuff that my flesh is made of, becomes weak, where do I draw strength? From him. Your strength may not be enough for me. The arm of flesh will fail you. Whether it's your arm or my arm, I can't put trust in, you know, 100%. I, I love y'all. If y'all offer to help, I may accept it. But if it doesn't turn out the way that we both thought it would, I'm not going to hold it against you. 
We're both just human. But there's one who does all things well, and if he can offer me strength, it will not fail me. Right? And then he goes on to say, verse number 24, and that you put on the new man, which is after God, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. We may wear it, put it on this way, but we are not the ones that can take it off of the rack and put it on ourselves. What he's saying is allow God to robe you or allow God to put the new man onto you. Why? Because it's fashioned after God himself in righteousness and true holiness. If I were to want, be the one to put it on, I'd defile his righteousness with my self-righteousness. Lord, I know I'm not worthy. But Lord, I pray that you'd robe me in your righteousness and your holiness. One, so that I can be in unity with you. Two, so that the world can see there's something in me that I didn't make. But three, so that maybe along the way I can edify others, not with what I have, but with what you've given me. Right, we talk about unity a whole lot, talking about the collective, but the true unity doesn't come between me and you, or between you and each other. True unity starts with unity between my spirit and his spirit. And it can only continue if the spirit that brought us together with that first line over there the church covenant says, having been led as we believe by who man no God the spirit the spirit that brought us together keeps us together I, I'm going to offend somebody sometime why because I'm my father's son can't help it okay, but the spirit can help smooth those things over did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.